has to be one of my favorite songs in the world. In fact, I remember singing that over and over again at the house, and my kids picked it up, and then we went to a church, and someone was singing it, and they were in the audience singing along. Kind of embarrassing, but not, uh, not really. I was doing the same thing. Thank you so much for that. And for the children's story as well, that was, that was wonderful. I thought that was going to be one of those stories where you said, uh, whoever comes up and takes this first. And let me tell you, I was already planning to beeline right there. I knew I could beat those kids. I can take that right there and, and it, would be, it would be done. It was, and then in my mind I was thinking, is she really going to give that $100? And which one is she going to give it to? And I was picking out who you should give it to and, and that didn't happen. But I'm still here if you'd like to, uh, to hand those to me. I need to get this sort of out of the, out of the air, just kind of put it out there. I don't, is, Pastor Getz is not here today, right? He told me that one of the requirements of preaching, really he didn't say it quite like that, but this is, the, this is what I got for him. One of the require, requirements of preaching here is that you had to have colored socks. And so I have to show you, I just want to let you know that you can trust me. I've, I've got colored socks on, everything is okay, everything that I say from here is going to be good, right? Well, let me introduce myself. I'm Pastor Alex Rodriguez. I'm with the Voice of Prophecy, but I'm just uh, about uh, eight weeks old with the Voice of Prophecy. We just moved. My wife and I and my four children relocated from Indiana. The wonderful plains of Indiana where corn and soybean are about the highest mountains that we ever see. Uh, you get a little bit more in the south, but not like this. This is really quite majestic. I had no idea that Colorado was so beautiful. In fact, I, I really, and I just, I'm just trying to be honest with you, I, I want to I be transparent, I really had no desire to ever go west. I'm, a, I'm an eastern, southern type of guy, uh, born in Puerto Rico, and just kind of moved up, and then I started, stopped complaining because it seemed like every time I'd complain, God would move me a little further north. And, uh, you know, I thought, more north, and I'm in Michigan, oh mercy. And uh, then Canada and other places, and I just, I didn't want to be there, but, uh, but the West has is, is, is been a blessing so far, other than your constant rain. Did you say 33 days? We don't even get that in Indiana. And in Indiana, we don't have to water our lawns either, by the way, um, which it's a blessing. You know, we, we thank God for the little things. I'm thanking the Lord that it did rain because I haven't quite figured out how to get that water thing working at the house that I'm renting. And so I'd pray about it and I'd say, Lord, I can't get this to work, and then he'd, he'd rain on the yard. So you can blame me, it's, it's my fault, I've been, I've been praying for rain. Well, we have a lot to cover this morning, um, but uh, just want to put a plug in for the Voice of Prophecy. It would be wrong to be up here and not, to not put a plug in for the Voice of Prophecy. The Lord has blessed and is blessing tremendously. God is indeed alive, and when we're faithful to Him, He will move mountains, He will open the storehouses of heaven, and He will pour out His blessings. And friends, I just want to tell you that He is pouring out His blessings on the Voice of Prophecy right now. It is amazing to see the things that God is doing, the plans that, that are going through the minds of those that are, that are working there. A lot of hours are being put in by the individuals that work there. I'm probably putting in the least amount of hours. I see these guys in there all the time. Brother Palmer, I saw you there. Man, that guy just lives there. Well, not really. I mean, he has a family and he takes care of them. But I know he's putting in a lot of hours, and some of the things that he comes up with is just absolutely amazing. God has blessed them tremendously. Just keep praying for us. Keep praying that God will guide. We're heading out. A lot of us are heading out to the GC and the pastor's session before then. Uh, you know that there's been some tension in the Adventist church over the last uh, couple of years. And um, I won't talk much about that other, to say, other than to say that we need to stay focused on mission. Satan is trying to divert and, and turn us away from what God has called us to do. Do we often, or ha uh, once in a while at least, I'm not going to say necessarily often, seems like it's been often in the last five or ten years, but do we sometimes have to take care of theological issues? Absolutely yes, we do. But we do that without forgetting the mission. And so as you pray, pray that God's people will come together, embrace the mission, and move forward, because Matthew 24 clearly tells us that this gospel will have to be preached where? How much of the world? All the world before what happens? Before Jesus comes. Do you want Jesus to come? Then we're going to have to preach the gospel to all the world. 
And some of these things that we do, chasing rabbits, we have to do them sometimes, but we can't lose track, we can't lose focus of the mission. Let's bow our heads together as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your goodness and mercy to us, Lord. I thank you that you are a gracious and wonderful God. And Lord, I ask that as we study the Word of God this morning, you will bless us, that you will send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to understand the Word. Teach us. You promised that you would teach us through the Counselor. And so we're asking for that this morning. And once again, Father, I ask that you speak through me. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I invite you to turn your, in your Bibles or electronic Bibles or whatever it is that you happen to have today. I don't have slides for you. I do apologize for that. Actually, I don't. But uh, I, I just don't typically preach with slides unless it's an evangelistic series. But um, I invite you to take your Bibles, open them up. Your fingers are going to be doing the walking today. We're going to be going from verse to verse looking through the Bible. We want to see what the Word of God has to say. Amen? Wow, that was weak. Uh, I'm going to be taking notes and reporting to Pastor Getz later. We want to see what the Word of God has to say, amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I, I knew this church had it in them. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to Acts chapter 2. Well, you know these verses well. There's no story that we're going to be going through here today that you haven't heard before, but I want to glean from the Bible the message that God has in store for us today. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, and the, as the Spirit gave them utterance. They began to speak in what? All of a sudden, you can imagine the place, all of a sudden, the house is shaken, the Holy Spirit is poured out in these sort of flame-looking things. That's something for your art mind to think about, something pretty like that. Flame-looking things that, that hit the heads, I guess, of these people, and all of a sudden, they began to speak in other tongues. We call this event Pentecost. We know it as Pentecost, and we understand that after this, what happened with the New Testament church? Did they die away? What was the result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Amazing growth, explosive growth. They not only spoke other tongues, but there was a boldness that came through them, and they went all in the known world talking and preaching about the love of Jesus, and somehow, in a short period of time, they evangelized the then known world. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? to have received that kind of power through the Holy Spirit? Other than I, I do like living in the age that I'm living in, I'm not really fond of not having light and restrooms and things of that nature. I would have loved to have been in that room receiving the Holy Spirit. There's something that bothers me about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And it should bother you as well. What bothers me about Acts chapter 2 is that it is not a singular event. What did I say? So if it's not a singular event, then what does that mean? Pentecost happened over and over again in the New Testament church. Pick up the books of Acts. Read through the books of Acts. Look at Acts of the Apostles. Over and over again, the Holy Spirit is pouring Himself out on His people. It's not just a one-time event. Over and over again, the Holy Spirit pours Himself out on God's people, giving them the strength to do that which needs to be done. Now, we could say, well, that happened because it was the New Testament church. That happened because it was the apostles, you know, the disciples. They walked with Jesus uh, because they had that close relationship. They'd been with Him. They'd seen Him. God was giving them some kind of special blessing. We could say that. It would be wrong, but we could say that. But the problem with that is 
that's not the only time the Holy Spirit was poured out. The New Testament church are not the only recipients of the Holy Spirit in Christian history. In fact, Christian history records that the Holy Spirit has been poured out over and over and over again on different congregations throughout the world. Let me share with you a couple of stories. This particular one is in the 1700s, early 1700s. This is the Moravian revivals uh, led by Nicholas Zinzendorf. Let me read to you a little bit here. It says, The Moravian revival of 1727 was thus preceded and then sustained by extraordinary praying. A spirit of grace, unity, and supplications grew among them. And then it's got a, a timeline here. Let me read through this time, timeline. On 16 July, many of the community covenanted together on their, own, on their own accord to meet often to pour out their hearts in prayer and hymns. On 5 August, the Count, this is uh, Count Nicholas Zinzendorf, the Count spent the whole night in prayer with about 12 or 14 or 14 other follower, following, a, 12 or 14 others following a large meeting for prayer at midnight where great emotion prevailed. On Sunday, 10 August, Pastor Roth, while leading the service at Hernhut, was overwhelmed by the power of the Lord about noon. He sank down into the dust before God, so did the whole congregation. They continued till midnight in prayer and singing, weeping, and praying. On Wednesday, 13 August, the Holy Spirit was poured out on them all. Their prayers were answered in ways far beyond anyone's expectations. Many of them decided to set aside certain times for continued earnest prayer. August 26, 24 men and 24 women covenanted together to continue praying in intervals of one hour each, day and night, each hour allocated by lots to different people. On 27 of August, this is the next day, this new regulation began. Others joined the intercessors, and the number involved increased to 77. They all carefully observed the hour which had been appointed to them. The intercessors had a weekly meeting where prayer needs were given to them. The children, there's even prayer for the children here. The children, also touched powerfully by God, began a similar plan among themselves. Those who heard their infant supplications were deeply moved. The children's prayers and supplications had a powerful impact on the whole community. Here's the kicker. That astonishing prayer meeting beginning in 1727 went on for 100 years. 100 years. George, if I told you let's go to prayer meeting and we're going to be there 100 years, <laughs> I know what my answer would be. This prayer meeting lasted 100 years. It was unique, known as the hourly intercession. It involved relays of men and women in prayer without ceasing made to God. The prayer also led to action, especially evangelism. More than 100 missionaries left the village community in the next 25 years, all constantly supported in prayer. You can find that in John Greenfield's book, Power from on High, Chapter 2. 100 years of prayer and revival and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit not in the New Testament time, but in the early 1700s. Well, one might say that's because it's the Dark Ages and we were coming out of the Dark Ages and God had to do something uh, marvelous and He had to do something powerful in order to, to allow everyone to see that God was still alive. You could say that, but again, that's not true because we skip over now to the early Sabbatarians. Now, what are the Sabbatarians? Anybody know? Who knows who the Sabbatarians were? Raise your hand. No one. <laughs> you know, I've got to tell you, I, um, I was praying and hoping that when I got up here and looked back, there wouldn't be a clock. I was, I was praying and hoping that. Um, but it's a good thing for you that I can't tell time. I told my wife, I said, honey, tomorrow I'm going to take a six-part series and I'm going to put it together into one. And she says, okay, we're going to be here forever. Don't do that on your first time. No, she didn't say that. No, I'll be gentle with you. I'll be gentle with you. I'm just looking at that clock. Okay. The Millerite movement. You remember William Miller, right? William Miller decides as he is reading and studying the Bible that Jesus is coming soon. And eventually they settle on October 22, 1844. Did you know that William Miller uh, really did not choose that date? Well, I say really, he did not choose that date. In fact, 
he doesn't actually believe that Jesus is coming back on October 22, 1844 until about two weeks before the date. History records that he didn't even sell his farm. That's not a date that he set. In fact, William Miller was not a date setter. He only knew that Jesus was coming soon, but he refused to set a date. When the date was set, he said, well, I guess it looks like, okay, I'll do it. But after the great disappointment in October 22, 1844, uh, the Millerite movement sort of broke up, obviously because of the great disappointment. You had one group of people that said, this is ridiculous, and that was the, large, the larger group. We're not going to have anything to do with this or religion or anything else, and they left. You had another group that said, no, 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 this is, this is absolutely accurate. In fact, Jesus did come. Jesus did come on October 22, 1844. He came into us spiritually, and now we're perfect. And we could spend all day sharing stories about what they did in their perfection that were just heinous, ungodly things. There was the group that William Miller was in who looked at these fanatics and said, if that's what happened on October 22, 1844, I want nothing to do with it. And so he went way out here, still believing that Jesus would soon come, but dismissing that anything at all happened on October 22, 1844. And then there was a small group, a remnant. You've probably heard that word before. A remnant group that said, wait a second, we've been praying, we've been studying, we've calculated this. Something did happen on October 22, 1844. God just has to tell us what it is. Those people became the Sabbatarians. And those Sabbatarians eventually in the 1860s united to become the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So there's a quick history lesson in Adventist history and who the Sabbatarians are. This happened during the time of the Sabbatarians. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has not been incorporated yet. This is in 1849, September 14, in Paris, Maine. Now, fanaticism was rampant in the early church. It was just a, a terrible thing. And there was a particular gentleman by the name of F.T. Howland who uh, the writers record longed troubled God's children with his errors and harsh spirit. And this story is about him. It's about him at a meeting at Brother S. Howland's a residence. I don't believe they were related. This is how it reads. During prayer, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon Brother S. Howland. There appeared to be a light around him, and his face was white as he approached F.T. Howland. And in the name of the Lord bid him leave the assembly of the saints, said he. You have torn the hearts of God's children and made them bleed. Leave the house, or God will smite you. That rebellious spirit, never before known to fear or to yield, sprang for his hat and in terror left the house. Now listen closely to what happens next. The power of God descended something as it did on the day of... Pen oh my goodness, this is why Sean doesn't wear shoes. I'm going to go down here. The power of God descended something as it did on the day of Pentecost, and five or six who had been deceived and led into error and fanaticism fell prostrate to the floor. Parents confessed to their children and children to their parents and to one another. Brother Jay and Andrews with deep feeling exclaimed, I would exchange a thousand errors for one truth. Such a scene of confessing and pleading with God for forgiveness we have seldom witnessed. James White, Life Sketches, page 260. Did you notice that? The Holy Spirit fell some, somewhat like when? You're getting quiet again. Pentecost. I told the, uh, the sound people that, that I often ask questions. Um, so just know that I'll ask questions. It's okay. I've got the socks on. <laughs> Somehow like Pentecost. This is a Pentecost outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the mid-1800s. Not the New Testament, the mid-1800s. And what bothers me about this is that, again, it's not a singular event. If we read the, the historians and, and all the material that we have about all that happened, we find that in early Adventism, the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's people constantly. Constantly. Uh, let me ask you a question. How many of you have been in the church for 10 years? Raise your hand. All right, keep your hands up. Drop them if we get too many years. 20 years. 
in the church 20 years? 30 years. Wow, you got some lifers here. 40 years. I'm still up. I'm 41. I'm, I'm a lifer. 50 years. I still see a hand. 60 years. Any hands? 60. Oh, oh I still see hands. S 70 years. Any hands still up 70 years? 80 years? 80 years. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anybody, anybody 90? Going for 90? 90, but in the 80s. How many years? 84 years. How many years, sir? 80? 83 ish. 83, 84. Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. You guys have seen a lot over those 80 years. It wasn't all. <laughs> yes. We have about 80 years of religious experience here in the audience today. So be truthful, be honest. How many of you in those 80 to 10 to 1, whatever experience you have in the Adventist church, how many of you have witnessed and experienced a Pentecost type outpouring of the Holy Spirit? How many? Raise your hands. One time, maybe? That's it. Well, what's, your, what's your typical attendance here? A couple hundred, maybe? Out of a couple hundred people and over 80 years of Christian experience, we have not experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as in Pentecost. Friends, does that bother you? It bothers me. It bothers me because it's never been that way. It's never been that way. The Holy Spirit has always been with God's people. It poured itself out on the New Testament church and continued to do, it, do that. It poured itself out during the dark ages for crying out loud. It poured itself out on the Adventist church in its inception and somehow, all of a sudden, the doors of the blessings of heaven were closed up. That should bother us. I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in church growth. I want to share with you a formula, a biblical formula, for the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And of course, for church growth, because they come hand in hand. It's a fail-safe formula. It's one of these things where I can confidently say, if God's people were to do this, the Holy Spirit would pour itself out on our congregation, on the world church, only if we followed this formula. And what's interesting about this whole conversation that we're having is that that formula is sitting on that banner every time we come in. We read it over and over again. I just don't think we understand it. And so we're going to try to take it apart this morning very quickly and understand its components, understand its parts, and see what we can do as God's people in order to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and get this mess of this world done so that we can be in the kingdom of heaven. Don't you want to be there? I'm done with this world. I, I can't stand it. I hate it. It's, it's just uh, atrocious. The constant violence, the, the killing, the, uh, it's just, it needs to get over. It's high time for this to be over. First, I want to start with if. Actually, uh, turn in your Bibles. Let's read it in your Bibles. Not on here because I want to pick out two verses that uh, aren't on there. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7, looking at verse 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, and now we get to the part we know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. It's important for us to understand this in context. 
not just the if my people, but the verses that come before this. He says that if all of a sudden there is no rain, and what does the rain mean? Well, you know, for them it probably meant for their crops, but for us it also means something else. What does it mean? It's the Holy Spirit. If all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you realize that your church has over 80 years of Christian experience, but you have never experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, if somehow that happens, God says, listen closely because I'm going to show you how you can get the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Are we understanding that? And we start with if. You see two words, and I like, I like the way they did this here. Because you'll notice that these two words just really, really stand out. You have then right here, and you have if up there. If and then. What does that tell you about this particular promise? It's what? It's conditional promise. If you will, then I will, is what God is trying to tell us. If you, then I. This is a conditional promise. And the issue with the conditional promises is that they also work the other way. If you don't, then what? Then, then I can't. Then I can't. Is it an issue of God not wanting? Does God want to pour His Holy Spirit out on us? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the Bible makes that clear. It says that God wants to give us the Holy Spirit more than we want or, or that we would give good gifts to our children. God wants to give us the Spirit. It's not an issue with God. It's an issue with His people. And God has given us the formula here. If, then. Let's start with my people. I'm going to show you five principles, five elements of church growth or catalyst to the, uh, to the outpour of the Holy Spirit in this, uh, in this verse. Five elements to church growth, to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that if we will practice these, if we will put them on the forefront of our minds, we will experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It starts with my people. God has a people. Yes or no? God has a people. God has always had a people. It's always been that way. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, who are God's people? Adam and Eve. Genesis 10, who's God's people? Oh, man, Pastor, wow, that's past, that's like eight verses past Genesis 1 and 2. The Bible says that God called Abram out of the what? Out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he said to, to Abram, I'm going to make out of you what? A great nation. So we have Abram, and he is leading a new nation. God is having to start over because of all the rebellion and, the, and Babel and all that confusion. God is pulling out a remnant and starting over with him. We continue on to the Exodus. Now we see them. They're sitting there uh, captive, and God sends Moses to lead them out of captivity. It continues through the Old Testament all the way until you get Judah and Israel. Did you know that the Bible says that God divorced Israel? He issued Israel a certificate of divorce. His people, God's own people, they had become so rebellious that God had to pull out a remnant of his own people and start over again. But of course, the Bible also tells us that Judah was as bad or worse than his sister Israel. Then you have the Babylonian captivity. How long were they going to be captive in Babylon? Seventy years, according to Jeremiah. At the end of that 70 years or, or, or near, nearing that period of time, we see Daniel praying and he understands that it's about time for God's people to go back. And eventually in Daniel chapter 9, God reveals to Daniel that God was going to give these people how many more years? 490 years. 490 years I'm going to give your people to do what? To do what? Man, you guys are quiet. Maybe it's just because this is a bigger, higher, and I can't hear, or maybe I'm just getting old. I just got bifocal lenses the other day. Oh, that's so embarrassing. Can't even read my little print Bible anymore. It's like... So I'll get closer to you. 490 years to do what? Seal up all sin. Seal up all sin? Be done with iniquity. And do what else? Everlasting righteousness. Bring, and who is everlasting righteousness? 
Jesus Christ, 490 years to preach the everlasting gospel, to tell the whole world that the Messiah is coming. 490 years, and yet the Bible records that when Jesus came, they did not know the day of their visitation. What a shame. And in Matthew 23, we see recorded, your house is left to you desolate. 490 years comes to an end in Acts chapter 7, the stoning of Stephen, and God once again has to pull out a remnant, and he starts the New Testament church. Pours the Holy Spirit out on that New Testament church, it goes out like wildfire preaching the everlasting gospel, uh, but, but, the Bible records that they would not stick with the faith. Because when we fast forward to Revelation chapter 6, we find four horses in Revelation chapter 6. The first one is what color? White. It's the white pure church coming out of that new New Testament remnant that lasted about Paul's time into about a hundred years or so, and then all of a sudden things that are strange to Scripture that God had never put in place begin to creep into the church and the horse goes from white to what color? Red. Some of you have studied this up. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. More creeps into the church and all of a sudden it goes from red to what color? What? Black. Black. The church has gotten so evil, it's now black. No, no taint or, 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 or speck of what Jesus had initially done in the New Testament church is there. And then eventually it goes from black to what? The pale. It's a dead church. The New Testament church practically dies off. And then God does something incredible. Turn with you, with your, in your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 in Scripture. Look at what God does after the pale horse. We'll begin reading in verse 13, Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time, 1,260 years, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But listen to verse 16. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. This is powerful. Don't miss this. The four horses take you into a dead church. God says, I've got to do something. And all of a sudden, he has this Bible prophecy that takes us 1,260 years and ends on what year? Thank you. Okay, we're, we're having a prophecy seminar here in the next uh, couple of weeks. <laughs> 1798. It ends in 1798. And in that, in that period of time, 1798, we're told that, that Satan was going to persecute the church, but something was going to help the church. It's called the earth. What is the earth in Bible prophecy? Uninhabited lands. The United States would help the church. Right at the time that he wanted to take them out, the Adventist church, or not the Adventist church, but the Christian church, God's people, would be helped by this earth. And then we get to this powerful verse in chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's after the four horses, it's after 1798, that all of a sudden the dragon gets so angry that he's now going to persecute the leftover. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us, friends, that there is a leftover. It tells us that God had to start over. Remember, the church was pale. It tells us that biblically, prophetically, God had to do the same thing that He has done in history. He had to pull out a remnant and start over. And friends, I believe that remnant to be the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Not because 
I'm proud or we're proud, not because we want to go around and say, hey, we're the remnant church. It's actually a solemn calling. It's an acknowledgement that God has always had a remnant, and in the last days, prophetically, he says that there is a remnant church, and he is giving that remnant church the word of God to preach to every kindred tongue and people. And it happens right at the end of these time periods. God has a people. God has a people. Has always had a people. If my people. And what's unique about these people is it's not just a group of people. It's my people who are what? Called by my name. So let me hear from you. What does that mean? What does it mean to be called by my name? I probably don't have time to do this, I know. What, what does it mean to be called by my name? Followers. Followers? What else? What was it? Christian? What does it mean to be in, in, in my name? Think deep. Ambassadors? Filled with the Spirit? Yet yeah, we're bouncing all around it. Fourth commandment? Fourth commandment? Creation. Creation. All of these things are great, but let me suggest something. My name means that God has a people who are of the same name. Oneness, sameness. God has a people who, like in Acts 2, are in one accord. John chapter 17. Turn with me. John chapter 17. If I'm going too fast, just pray for me. I remember I was preaching in my old church and one of the little girls came up to a member, I think it was her mom, and said, why does the pastor look so mad? I just get passionate, I, I just, uh, I'm passionate. John chapter 17, look at verse six. John chapter 17, verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they, and they have kept your word. Bounce down to verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be what? That they may be one as we are. What does it mean to be a people in my name, it means to be a people in one accord. Principle number one to church growth. Element number one. God needs a people who will be in one accord. Is the Campion Church in one accord? Have you come together and confessed to each other your sins? Have you asked for repentance? Have you come in prayer, humbling yourselves and saying, we want to be in one accord? For us at the voice of prophecy is the voice of prophecy in one accord. God won't open the storehouses of heaven. God cannot open the storehouses of heaven unless he has a people who are in one accord. Principle number one. Principle number two, we read on. If my people who are called by my name will, what's that word there? Humble themselves. Again, what does that mean? We can't take as many, but what does that mean? To humble yourself. To be meek? Yes. What else? Not self-sufficient. So who said that? So if you're not self-sufficient, then you are sufficient through who? Depend on someone else, God. Depending, depend on God. Amen. You hit the nail on the head. Praise the Lord. To be humble means more than just to go and, and meekly go to somebody and say, oh, I'm so sorry, although it encompasses all of that. To be humble at the core means that we are no longer in control, that we have given our control fully and completely to God. We no longer want to be the head, but we are now the what? We're now the tail. We're happy to be there. We're happy to serve. We're happy to do the will of God. Do you want to do the will of God? Turn with me to a quick story. You know it. We probably don't have to turn there, but Mark. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9.
Mark chapter 9, looking at verse 14. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, this is verse 17, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Why could they not cast it out? Full of pride. Because if you remember the story, they had been granted the power to cast out demons. And they had already done that. In fact, God sent them out and they came out all happy. Look at what we've done. The demons even listened to us. It wasn't an issue of not being able to. It was something else. And the issue was pride. They were fighting about who was the greatest. Who was the greatest? God needs a people who are humble. A people who say, it's not by might nor by power, but by what? By my spirit, saith the Lord. Where's that found? Okay, you can't answer any more questions. <laughs> Zechariah 4, 6, absolutely. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Remember the story of the fig tree in Matthew chapter 21, where Jesus comes to the fig tree and he looks and he sees and there's leaves on the tree and, and he says, wow, it has figs. And he goes up to it and what did he find? No figs. He curses the fig tree not because we have an evil and mean God. He curses the fig tree because he got to Israel. They were supposed to preach the everlasting gospel to the whole world, but they had no fruit. They had done nothing. On the outside, he says, you guys look good, but on the inside, you are rotten to the core. It's not been about me. It's been about you this whole time. God needs a people, number one. God need, needs a people who are called by His name, which means they are in one accord. Number two, God needs a people who are willing to be about my Father's business. Not about your business, not about my business, about the Father's business. It's His will that we do, not ours. Number three, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and what? and pray. I was a part of the Sabbath school here just hanging out in the back because I wanted to look at a few notes today and all of a sudden they started talking about a house of prayer and I thought well I should talk but then I said if I talk then I'll, I'll ruin my sermon. A house of prayer. Are you a house of prayer? Matthew chapter 21 verse 13 who has that? My son says you're gonna preach that I'm gonna beat you as you look at verses. Matthew chapter 21 verse 13 whoever has that stand up and read it loud. Matthew 21, 13. What does it say? It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You are making the wrong thing. Wow, you turned that computer really quick. <laughs> my house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. A prayer. Is this house a house of prayer? What is a house of prayer? Let me ask you. If you were to work, how many of you work 40 hours a week? Some, how many of you work more than 40 hours a week? Wow. All right. So for those of you who work 40 hours a week or more, or even less, do you think that you could work, instead of 40 hours a week, do you think that you could work 32 hours a week? Do you think you could? No, we can't, Pastor. Haven't you seen the, the real estate market in, in Colorado? Oh, yes, I've seen it. Seriously, do you think that you could work 32 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week? And in that extra eight hours that you would have been working, instead of reporting to work, report to the church. Come here. What are we going to do here? Well, we're going to pray like mad. We're going to come together and we're going to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're going to confess to each other. We're going to repent. We're going to humble ourselves before the Lord Almighty God because in us there is no power. And then from there we're going to go out into the community and we're going to hit it. Every single week, that extra eight hours, we're going to work for the salvation of souls and pray like crazy. 
What do you think would happen if we did that right here in the Campion Church? What do you think would be the result of that? Standing room only in the whole county would know. Standing room only in the whole county would know. Would know. Anything else? I remember I asked that question in a congregation once and somebody said, Pastor, I think Jesus would come. Yeah, yeah, he would, wouldn't he? You see, the issue in the Adventist church is not an issue of knowledge. It's not some, some issue about we don't know. We know. We know what needs to be done, but when it comes to, to knowing and doing, there's something that is, is putting a block, a bridge, a wedge in that, and, and we just can't do it. We can't do it. Oh, if the Holy Spirit would pour itself out on us, then we would do it. But friends, when the trumpet sounds and the bridegroom is coming, how many virgins were found without oil? Five, half. If we wait until the end, it'll be too late for many. The time to work is now. Are you a house of prayer? A house of prayer is a house that comes together and prays not worrying about the externals, but worrying about coming before the Holy Throne of Grace and asking God to bless. God will take care of the rest. He will open up the storehouses of heaven and bless us in ways we have never seen. Principle number three is a house of prayer. Principle number one, God needs a people who are called by His name, a people of one accord. Principle number two, we need to be about our Father's business. Principle number three, we need to be a house of prayer. And principle number four, we need to seek His face. This is found in John chapter 5, verse 39. Turn with me to John chapter 5, verse 39. John chapter 5, verse 39. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that what? That testify of me. What does that have to do with seeking God's face? What well, has everything to do with seeking God's face? How do you seek God's face? Where do you go? How many of you have ever marched up to the doors of heaven, knocked on the door and said, I want an audience with Jesus? Oh yeah, we do that when we pray. But I'm talking about physically. How many of you have done that physically? None. None. Because we don't know the pathway to heaven. We don't know the road that leads up there. And even if we did, we couldn't, we, we couldn't go up there. It amazes me that uh, science has been sending radio signals out into the world for, for years, hoping to find other worlds, hoping to receive an answer. Well, they're never going to receive an answer because this is the only world that is in the miserable mess that it's in. We've been shut out from the rest of the world. This is why Jesus came. It's the ladder, remember Jacob's dream, Jacob's ladder. Jesus bridges the gap between heaven and earth. But friends, we can't climb that ladder until God decides he's going to take us with him. So the main way that we seek the face of God, that we find the face of God, is right here. It's right here. It's the word of God. 2 Chronicles 34, we don't have time to look it up, but 2 Chronicles 34, you can start reading it about verse 8, is the story of Josiah. Love that story. In that particular story of Josiah, we find that, that he has ordered uh, the people to clean the temple, and all of a sudden, someone finds the book of the law in the temple. And, and I love the way the Bible describes it. It's like, whoa, I found the book of the law. Does that bother you? It bothers me. How do you lose the book of the law? How do you lose the word of God? How do you lose that? Let me ask you, friends, is it possible that we in the Adventist church who have not experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in over 80 years have somehow lost the book of the law? Oh, I know, we're good Adventists. Every single one of us has at least 20 or 30 Bibles sitting there. I'm not talking about knowing what shelf it's in. I'm talking about knowing what's in it. Are you reading it? Are you spending quality time in the Word of God? It's the only place we're going to find the face of God. We can't find it anywhere else. I remember in my early years of being a pastor, I hadn't been a pastor more than, than two or three months. 
You know how pastors do, they preach and then they walk down the aisle and then they sit in the back and they, they shake everybody's hands. And I did that because I didn't know what else to do. I didn't come into, into my career as a as first generation pastor. I was a second generation, or not second generation, but second career pastor. And so I, I really didn't get trained for the pastorate. So when I got thrown into the pastorate, I was like on my own. You know, you just sink or swim. And I had seen, I've been in church all my life, and I had seen that that's what pastors do. They walk to the back and they shake people's hands. So I walked to the back and I was shaking people's hands. And this one guy came to me. He wasn't an Adventist. He came to me. He shook my hand. He looked me in the eyes and he said, thank you for bringing the Bible back into the church. I was shocked. I was shocked. What else are you supposed to do as a pastor? I mean, they didn't give me a manual, but they said I was a pastor, and the only thing I know is to read the Bible, so that's what I'm going to do. What else have we been doing? And friends, after I've been in the ministry for a while, I've realized that we as pastors have not been breaking the bread of life from up front. And I realized something that was startling. I realized that many of us pastors have not been breaking the bread of life in our own homes and in our own personal lives. And so I was shocked one day as I asked a group of pastors, this is right as I was starting, uh, tell me about your devotional life. There was about six or seven of us gathered in, in a circle. Tell me about your devotional life. I would like to have a strong devotional life, but I'm new at this. What do you do as pastors? Tell me your devotional life. And every single one of us, of the, one of them, put their heads down. I pressed it again. I said, well, maybe, maybe they misunderstood me. And so I re-asked the question in a different way. And again, the same answer. Later on, later in that afternoon, I took one of them aside. We were walking in a park, and I said, you've got to tell me what's up. And he said, well, the reality is that we're so busy with all the phone calls and all the board meetings and all the sermon preparations that about all we have left to give is a quick prayer and go. Lord, have mercy. Yeah, I, I know why the Holy Spirit hasn't been poured out in a long time. And it's not just the pastors. It's time to seek God in His Word. God needs a people who are called by His name. People who are on one accord. God needs a people who are about God's business. God needs a house of prayer. And God needs a people of the book. God didn't just pull us out as a remnant just to sit around and wait for Jesus to come. We've got to be a people of the book. And finally, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. What do you think that means? Well, it means a lot of things, but give me some thoughts. Repent. You know that Ellen White says that there are four items to revival? Four items to revival. Anybody know them? Prayer, confession, repentance, and humiliation. If God's people will do those, she says, you'll see revival. Those are all incorporated in this here. Repentance, yes. Turn from your wicked ways. What does that mean to turn from your wicked ways? Let me suggest something, because we're running out of time. You're probably saying, we ran out of time a long time ago, Pastor. But you know, what's nice to come as a guest speaker is that you can just do whatever you want, and then you leave, and the pastor has to clean it up. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that great? And he's not even here to stop me. I, I know sometimes in my church, we'd have a special event or whatever, I'd be speaking, and, and back in the back, there'd be something like, oh, come on. I just wasn't wired that way. Turn from their wicked ways. What do, you, what do we mean with this? This might be sensitive for some. I know. You're just, got, you're just going to have to deal with it. You're just going to have to pray about it. Give it to the Lord. I'm not here to ruffle feathers. I'm just here to preach the everlasting gospel and just tell you what's in the Bible. God has given us the Word of God written by who? Who wrote the Word? The Holy Spirit worked on and pressed the minds of men. And who were these men, for the most part? Except for maybe King Nebuchadnezzar. Prophets. Scripture says that I do nothing unless I reveal it first to the what? 
to the prophets. Jeremiah chapter 25, look this one up. Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25, beginning at verse 3, Jeremiah 25, verse 3. It says, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, this is the twenty-third year in which the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. Verse 4. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants and the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened, nor inclined your ear to hear. Over and over again, God sent the prophets to Israel, but instead of listening to the prophets, what did they do with the prophets? They stoned them. They killed them. They ridiculed them. They would not listen to the message that God had given to the prophets. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says, Here are the saints. Here are those that have the testimony of Jesus. God's end-time people are going to be a people that have the testimony We don't have to go far to, be, to, to, to have that identified to us because in Revelation chapter 19, 10, it tells us what that testimony is. It says it's what? The spirit of prophecy. And what is the spirit of prophecy? Huh? The Holy Spirit to the prophets? That's a good answer. <laughs> that is a careful, calculated answer. What is that... Revelation 19.10, a spirit of prophecy, what is it? It's a revelation that God has made to every single one of the prophets that he asked to write it down. That's what it is. It covers all of the prophets that are in Scripture, and it covers all of the prophets that will be in the last days. A gem that I had never seen before. She is the most balanced woman I have ever read. Balanced. Absolutely. We just, we've just never taught that side of her. We've taught the thou shalt not. But we've never taught the real Ellen White. We're starting to understand that now and we're beginning to teach it. But wow, the damage that we've done. Man, she was real. And she had a twofold passion. Her twofold passion was all about getting a people back to the Word of God and the love of the Father. That was it. That was it. Everything she writes is about that. Get back into the Word and let me tell you about Jesus. God says that when we begin to turn from our wicked ways, and the prophets were the ones that are, were given to us to help us turn from our wicked ways through the power of the Holy Spirit, then He's willing to heal the land. So that fifth and, fifth and final element is God needs a people of the testimony. Let me go through them again. Number one, God needs a people who are in one accord. God needs a people who are about His Father's business. God needs a people of prayer. God needs a people of the Word. God needs a people of the testimony. When we as a people of God do these five things, He promises that He will do what? Then I will hear from heaven. I will do what? Forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Don't forget the context. We begin, began in verse 12 and we talked about if all of a sudden you wake up one morning and there's no rain, here's what to do. So the healing is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Do you want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you want it in your church? Do you want it in your ministry? That's the formula. That's the formula right there. It's simple. It's been staring us in the face. It's high time that God's people Begin to do that which God has asked so that God will pour His Spirit out on us. Let's bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You again for Your goodness, Lord, Your mercy. I thank You that, uh, man, even though we have been slow, You are still there. What an amazing God You are. He told Moses, You were a long-suffering God, and we're so grateful for that. 
But it's time to awaken, Father. The, the trumpet is sound, sounding. The bridegroom is coming. We see it everywhere around. We know Jesus is coming soon. And we are in desperate, desperate need of your power. And so, Father, we come to you this morning confessing our sin, saying, Lord, we have not been where we should, but we want to be there, and we want your Spirit. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our frailty. Forgive us for our pride. For those here, Father, who have been walking the walk faithfully, I thank you, Lord, for each one of them. I ask that they continue to pray. But, Father, for the rest of us who have been playing on both sides of the field, I ask that you will change our hearts and that you will draw us near to you. I pray a great blessing over this church that you will pour your spirit out on it and that they will go out preaching with great power and this whole city will be converted. And I thank you for your promises. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.